Hello, my name is Jeff Messier. I'm a professor in electrical and computer engineering in the Schulich School of Engineering at the University of Calgary. And this is module four in my computer networks lecture series where I introduce the data link layer or layer two in the protocol stack. So as I mentioned, we're gonna use the protocol stack as kind of the way we organize this lecture or sort of a, uh, a high level map just so we can kind of see exactly where we are in our discussion. And so we've already relatively briefly dealt with the physical layer. So we talked about the physical layer the job of the physical layer is to take ones and zeros essentially that are passed down from the data link layer, turn it into waveforms, analog waveforms that can travel over some kind of analog channel, a wire, a wireless link, something like that. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the next layer up in the protocol stack, which is the data link layer. And we're actually gonna spend a lot of time on the data link layer because there's a lot of functionality lumped or sort of rolled into it. And because of that, the data link layer is typically divided into two sub layers. The first one is, whoops. The first one is the logical link control layer. And the second one is the medium access control layer. And both of these layers do some pretty big jobs for us. So the logical link control layer exists to create the illusion of an error-free link between two nodes that are transmitting, which is, you know, when you sort of think about it, quite a trick because we know that the physical layer link has a certain probability of error, PE, and we're gonna try to make it look like those errors don't exist. And so we'll talk about how that works. And the medium access control layer or MAC is responsible for coordinating the situation where we have multiple nodes all trying to access a shared channel. And so what I basically wanna do with this introductory module is kind of set the stage. So we're looking at the data link layer. We've got these two sub layers. Let's talk about the LLC or the logical link control layer first. And at a high level, the purpose of the LLC is to provide reliable, a reliable communication link between just two nodes that happen to be communicating. There are also some authentication and handshaking uh, capabilities built into the LLC, control messages that are sent back and forth to create a connection and then to terminate the connection. But we're not really gonna be focusing on that for the purposes of our discussion in the first part of this class. Really, we're gonna be focusing on how we create this reliable link. And something that I, sh I should mention about this lecture series is that you know the purpose of these lectures is really not to dive into any one standard and you know understand it in a, in a great level of detail. I will be constantly pulling in examples from Ethernet, from Wi-Fi, from TCP, from IP as we go through the course, but I'm going to focus on the high level issues that are common to all networks that all networks need to solve because really my job as an instructor is to give you an education that is durable. So if I make you an expert in only one standard, as soon as that standard disappears or is eclipsed by another faster standard, then your knowledge is out of date. However, if I try to focus on you know, the fundamental issues of computer networks and the, the techniques and the strategies and the mathematics really for solving those problems, then you're really gonna be independent of standard. You'll be able to sort of re pick up and read any standard that happens to be relevant to your job and understand that that particular standard is just taking its particular strategy for tackling these fundamental issues. And so in the spirit of that, I'm not going to talk about this authentication and 
um, sort of connection, establishment, and termination handshaking at this point. I'm going to save that discussion later on when we talk about the session layer further up the protocol stack. And so for now, we're going to focus on how the logical link control layer transforms, and I put this in quotation marks, an error-prone physical layer into a link that appears almost completely error-free. And so how do we accomplish this? Well, you know, as in most things in networking, as you're going to see, we can actually take real-world examples quite often from just verbal communication or conversation and use those examples to understand how computer networks solve similar problems. And so, first of all, <clears throat> when we talk about an error-free link, do we really need it? I guess that is, is the first question. And the answer is sometimes we don't need it, but most of the times we do. So some network traffic can tolerate a, a certain amount of error in the received packets. And this traffic is mainly things like voice traffic. You know, if there's some static in our voice signal, the brain is pretty good at sort of still understanding what is being said. If we have a bit of error in a streaming video stream, you know, we're on a, a Zoom call or a FaceTime call and there's a little bit of garbling in the video, we can still sort of see what's going on. Um, even an image, arguably, if there's some distortion in an image, we can kind of see what uh, the image is representing, but we really don't want that, right? I mean, nobody wants to be watching a movie and then just like trying to barely decipher what's going on. And a lot of network traffic just simply can't tolerate errors at all. So if you're downloading an app, for example, and a bunch of bits get garbled, that program's just not going to work, chances are, on your computer or on your phone. If you're sending an email, you don't want characters to be flipped in your email so that all of a sudden the, re the reader is reading something you didn't write. Same with a social media post, same with you know, really browsing the web. You don't want to have a garbled web page where you can't understand the information. And so having an error-free link is, is super important. And so how do we accomplish this miraculous feat? Well, basically we can, again, take an analogy from conversation. So an example of an error-prone physical layer might be, you know, when you're having a conversation with a friend in a noisy restaurant. So there's lots of noise. You're saying things to the friend, the friend is talking back, but you can't always hear what the other person is saying. And so you try to tell your friend a joke and the friend just doesn't laugh and it's not because it wasn't funny, the friend just doesn't hear it. And so what do you do if the friend hasn't heard the joke? Retransmit, basically. You just, you know, if you can tell the friend hasn't heard the joke or if the friend says what I, I i didn't hear what you said you just tell them again and hopefully this time it'll be a little bit less noisy in the restaurant and they'll hear what you're saying and so when we receive um, a packet of information and there's some error in that information what do we do at the data link layer we retransmit and that's how we do it. Basically, we sort of watch our packets coming in. And if there's errors, then we just basically throw that packet away and we ask the transmitter to resend. And this is the job of the logical link control layer. And what I should say is that this retransmission, you know, according to the OSI sort of classic protocol stack, model, the logical link control layer is responsible for retransmission. However, um, a lot of popular standards out there sort of incorporate retransmission mechanisms into the other layers. So for example, the Wi-Fi standard arguably has its retransmission built into the medium access control layer. And so, you know, it's not always strictly at the LLC, but for the purposes of our discussion, we'll assume that it is. And so retransmission gives, I guess, the illusion of an error-free link, but this has a cost. And much of our discussion, when we get into focusing on retransmission mechanisms, will deal with that cost. And, you know, if, if you think about it, okay, well, you know, we're, we're retransmitting 
frames and we'll just keep retransmitting until the frame eventually gets through. And so we eliminate errors when we do that. But of course the cost is basically the time we spent retransmitting. So the more time we spent retransmitting, the less time we have to transmit new information and the effective throughput of our link basically goes down. And so that's gonna be one of the fundamental trade-offs that we explore. Retransmissions will reduce errors at the cost of also reducing effective throughput. So the medium access control layer, or MAC as it's very commonly known, most commonly known, is where we finally start to talk about a proper network. So I, I kind of define a network as a situation where we have more than two nodes. You're gonna see that when we talk about a lot of the logical link control layer, retransmission, error detection stuff, that's really, all about one node communicating to the other node. However, with at the Mac layer, all of a sudden we have three nodes or four nodes or a whole bunch of nodes. And the scenario that the Mac focuses on very specifically is having all of these nodes compete for access to a shared channel. And that means the Mac layer does not concern itself with a multi-hop network, what we mean by shared channel is that every node can transmit directly to every other node. So every node can hear everybody else. And back in the day, you know, old, as we're going to see later when we talk a bit more about Ethernet, old Ethernet networks used to actually share a common wire. So there was a single coaxial cable that would run between multiple nodes. Well, this should be node two all the way up to node n. And let's say when node two transmitted onto the shared wire and it was sending a message to node one, all the other nodes could hear it as well. As we're gonna learn, ethernet isn't designed that way anymore. And so really the most relevant shared channel today is the wireless channel. And so we have several nodes all within the same vicinity when node n generates a wireless signal that is addressed to node 2, node 1 can hear it as well. And so the MAC layer is all about sort of controlling and coordinating this access to a shared channel. And we're going to talk about a number of specific MAC algorithms, but again, like a lot of times in networking, we're gonna be able to draw analogies between networking and just regular conversation because the classic shared channel is the audio channel. So if you're sharing a room with multiple people, everybody can hear what everybody else is saying. So in a classroom, in your living room, in an automobile. And so how do we manage access to this shared verbal channel? Well, there's a whole bunch of different ways actually. And each way will sort of lead us to talking about an actual specific Mac protocol. So for example, we have the toddler example. So toddlers, if you know anyone who is maybe one or two years old, they don't worry too much about interrupting. If something comes into their minds, it basically immediately comes out of their mouths. Dad, this, dad, that. And it doesn't matter if, you know, you're talking or the parent is talking, they tend to interrupt. And as we're going to see, this is actually a real life Mac protocol called Aloha. We know though, as we grow up, as we're no longer toddlers, we get taught to have a quote unquote proper conversation. And an adult having a conversation follows certain rules. One of the primary rules being don't interrupt. If somebody else is talking, wait for that person to finish. And then when there's a gap in the conversation, then you get to talk. That's going to lead us to a, another family of Mac protocols, which is the primary Mac protocol used by Wi-Fi systems today. And finally, you know, we can even take, you know, a traditional classroom as an example where we have a shared verbal class or shared verbal channel in the classroom. However, there is sort of a hierarchy of control. So 
when an instructor, you know, gen generally speaking, when an instructor walks into the room, the instructor assumes control of that shared channel and starts to instruct, start to talk. And if a student has a question, the student requests access to that shared channel by raising their hand. And as soon as a hand is raised, the instructor perhaps will finish speaking and then grant access to the channel by saying, oh, please ask your question. The student will then have access to the channel. The student will ask the question and then implicitly return control to the instructor as the instructor answers the question. And this is sort of a, um, you know, again, kind of a hierarchical control where you've got one node, sort of a master node on the shared channel that's in charge of the channel and it is responsible for granting access to the other nodes. And now I, I just want to say a final word about packets and frames. So when we were talking about encapsulation earlier on in our lecture series, we were talking about the information being divided into, or the, the digital information, the ones and zeros being sort of divided into groups and each group was called a packet. The packet had a payload which contained the user information or the information from the next layer up on the protocol stack and then each layer in the protocol stack added its own control information in the header. You, As we talk about the data link layer and certainly when people talk about the physical layer, we tend to use the term frames rather than packets. And what's the difference between a frame and a packet? Really nothing. Um, except it just sort of gives you an indication of how low you are down in the protocol stack. So generally, layer two and below, we refer to, uh, we'll use the term frames. And uh, layer three and above, we tend to use the term packets. And I'll try to adhere to this convention, but you'll even, you'll notice me making mistakes through the, through the lectures where sometimes I'll talk about packets at the Mac layer, for example, or frames at the routing layer, but really I shouldn't be. So, so I'm going to try to use the term frames for the data link stuff, and then we'll switch to packets after that. And a data link layer frame consists of three main parts. So first of all, we have the header and the payload, which we've talked about before. What are some of the things that we might find in the header of a data link layer or sorry, what are some of the things we might find in a data link layer header? Um, these would be things like how big is the frame? So like a frame size field, um, an address perhaps that might be used for the Mac layer. So for example, when we send a, a frame over a shared channel, we have to indicate who it's for. So the Mac layer needs to use an address for that. It will also indicate who the frame is from. So there'll be a, a destination and a source address field. The logical link control layer, if it uses some sort of retransmission, might have a sequence number for the frame. So we know if we're receiving a new frame or if we've got, um, or if this is a retransmission of an existing frame. And there's other things as well. And, and the specific standard that you work with will have, you know, the header and all of the contents. Um, laid out in a fair amount of detail. We of course have a payload which contains all the information that we've received from layer three of the protocol stack and above. So the payload will include any header information that might be used in layer three, four, five, and so on. And finally, the new thing that we have, and uh, we'll talk about this in a lot more detail, is something called a checksum. And a checksum is used to detect errors in a frame. And this is important for the retransmission mechanism that we're going to be talking about because we need to know when a frame is corrupted or we need to know when a frame contains bad bits so that we know it needs to be retransmitted. And as we're going to turn out, this is actually not a trivial problem and there are many different ways to approach it, which is what we're going to talk about next.